Well, good morning, everybody. Oh, man, I, uh, I'm really excited for what I think God is going to be doing today in our time as we study his word. Eventually, we're going to get to Psalm 42, but we're going to start off in Mark chapter 4. So can we just dive in? You guys ready to go? Yeah, all right. So, so the disciples had just finished a very long day of ministry. Uh, Jesus had been teaching and doing miracles all around the Sea of Galilee for uh, several days in, the, in a row now. And it's relatively earlier on in the ministry. So the disciples are still trying to figure Jesus out. Who is this guy? Uh, what, what, where is he going with all of this? Clearly there's something different about him. But they're exhausted. It's been a long couple of days after a long day in the heat with all these people right next to this water. We pick up our story and Mark chapter 4, starting in verse 35. This is what it says. That day, when evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let us go to the other side. Uh, the Sea of Galilee is, is a really big lake, uh, and, and it's big enough that the cities were kind of all around the shore of the lake. And so Jesus says, hey, let, let's go over here. I think we need to do ministry on the other side. And so they do it. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. Like right then and there, Jesus says, it's evening time, let's go to the other side. So they get in the boat and they start sailing. I have always figured that it was just them in the boat, but Mark is really careful to show us that there were others there too. There were also other boats with them. It's not Jesus and the disciples only, there are other boats. Now, time goes by, the disciples are rowing or sailing or whatever that looks like. And my picture of what that is, is, is that the boat is kind of rocking back and forth and it's warm and the shadows are getting long and maybe one of the disciples is singing a lullaby and eventually Jesus drifts off to sleep. And maybe just, oh, how did, I, how did I go to sleep right here? But that's not exactly the picture that Mark paints for us. Mark says that Jesus went to find a cushion so that he can intentionally take a nap. And this really strikes me as funny because I picture the disciples ro rowing hard and they're doing ropes and whatever it is, all the stuff that you do when you're sailing. Like the disciples are working really, really hard and then they hear a rustling and they turn back and Jesus is digging between the cooler and the empty life jacket and pulls out a down pillow and just kind of curls up at the back of the boat because he's taking a nap. This is an intentional thing. Like, disciples, could you guys keep all the sailing stuff down? It's time for me to sleep, all right? I'm kind of a big deal, and I'm going to take a nap right now. So Jesus, he takes a nap. He goes to sleep. And then a little bit of time later goes by, and the disciples off in the distance see a cloud start to come. And there's a little bit of a breeze and the waves start to, to pick up just little by little. And eventually this builds and builds and builds until it gets pretty intense. And a storm has rolled in. Mark 4.37 says this, a furious squall came up. I find squall to be a funny word. Squall, it's not one that I use regularly in my language. It's what, when my kids are crying, I call it that they're squalling, right? Like, I, I don't talk about a squall. But this, this word for squall, the Greek word, literally means an intense windstorm, like a gale force wind. That's what this word means. It's like a gale force wind. So something you should know about the area, the geography of this area. Like I said, the Sea of Galilee is a big lake, and it's surrounded by these mountains. And on the other side of the mountains is the Mediterranean Sea. So because of the elevation and just the way that everything is laid out, it's perfect for these intense windstorms to blow up over the mountains and all of a sudden just blow over the Sea of Galilee. These straight winds that would, that would blow with really a high level of intensity. They would be extreme. It was prone to those sudden extreme winds. And so what's normal for people who are on a boat, for people who are sailing, is that when the winds come, when the storm comes and the waves kick up, the idea is you want to keep the bow of the boat pointed into the waves. 
When you're in trouble, keep the bow of the boat pointed into the waves because the bow of the boat is what can break the waves. The bow breaks the waves and the waves go off to the either side and it keeps the water out of the boat. The risk though of the wind is that it's really tough because if you get the bow just a little bit off, the wind's gonna push the boat sideways and the next thing you know, the waves are coming against the side of the boat and the water spills over the rails of the boat and it builds and there's more and more water and there's risk of that boat tipping over. There's risk of that boat capsizing. And that's exactly where we find Jesus and the disciples. This furious gale, this windstorm blows in and the waves are breaking over the side of the boat. The bow isn't pointed into the wind anymore. It's not pointed into the waves, so much so that it was nearly swamped. So much so that the thing was, was about to go down. Now, listen, I love the water. I love being on boats. I've, I've, I've spent plenty of time on the water, but I'm not really a sailor. So if you and I were out in the middle of Lake Michigan and a windstorm blows in and water's coming over the side of the boat, I hope you can swim well because you're gonna have to take the both of us. I mean, it's, it's not gonna be good. I'm gonna be panicked. It's gonna be every man for himself. Grab the life jacket and make your way in for the shore because I've got no experience doing this kind of thing. I don't have any experience sailing a boat in a windstorm, but the disciples are different. Don't forget that the disciples are lifetime generational fishermen. The disciples probably were on that boat before they knew how to walk. They grew up on the water. They learned to sail from their fathers who learned to sail from their fathers who learned to sail from their fathers. And they learned to sail on this lake. They know all about the weather patterns of this lake. They know all about what to do when the storm rolls in, what to do when the winds are really, really tough. They know all of the secrets. They are not inexperienced people like you or me. These are experts. And when the experts are panicking, it's intense. When the experts are worried, you better believe this is a serious storm. This is a serious issue. And don't forget, they're not alone. In my mind, I've always pictured that this is just Jesus and his disciples. Like, they're the only boat out on the water. Everybody else was smart enough to not be on the water right now. But remember, Mark told us that there were other boats with them. So there's a whole crowd, a whole community of boats that are out there. In other words, it's not just Jesus and the disciples who are at risk. It's every soul and every boat that is at risk. Every other boat has got waves coming in over the side. Every other boat there is taking on water. Every boat says we're about to capsize. It's real. It's bad. It's the whole community. Now, time out. Before we continue, I think there's an obvious parallel that we can make here. And, and the parallel is this. All of us, all of us face windstorms in our life. All of us have times in our life where we think everything is going okay, and all of a sudden, unexpectedly, gale force winds start to blow, and it makes our surrounding environment so volatile that we think we're going to start taking on water, and our lives are at risk of capsizing. All of us face times in life where, where the wind blows so hard it feels like we can't hear ourselves think and we're not making any progress. We all have those situations. I, I, I read that there are other boats there and I think about uh, leadership and what it's like to lead other people. I know many of you lead businesses or lead organizations and sometimes when you face that windstorm you realize this crisis, it doesn't just affect me, it affects all of these people. Uh, Maybe, maybe you guys missed the revenue target. And now someone's telling you that you're gonna have to look at staff reductions. Or maybe you're the one who has to make the decision, are we gonna do staff reductions or not? And look, these are people. You love these people. You don't make this decision lightly. This is, this is really, really hard. This is a crisis that doesn't just affect you. It affects everybody around you as well. And then on the back side of it, you've got to figure out how do I do the same amount of work with less people? Because that's going to put a burden on everybody else. Maybe the storm for you is that, is that you got on the wrong side of the market. You put too many resources in the wrong place. You made too many wrong assumptions. And now every time you check the account, you get that sick feeling in your stomach. 
It takes your breath away because you know the implications. And you know it's not just going to affect you, it's going to affect everybody around you. You know the implications. Maybe the IPO failed. Maybe the VC firm is looking for some serious changes and it's not just going to affect you, it's gonna affect all the people that you love that are around you. We all face windstorms. Your windstorm could be at home. A child who's being bullied at school. You didn't expect this. You thought everything was gonna be okay and all of a sudden, it's not just affecting you, it's affecting your kids. Maybe, maybe your son, you found out that he's smoking weed again. And it feels like it's, it's causing your entire family to like take on water and you're against the ropes and you don't know what to do now because it's not just you. You bought the house. You signed the lease expecting that this was going to be the income and now something has changed and it's not just affecting you. It's affecting everybody around you. We all face storms. We all face the the, 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 the windstorms, the hurricanes, the tempest. We all face these things. But there's a few things that I've noticed about the storms. Sometimes, some storms come because we're fleeing from God. Sometimes we face storms because we're going in a direction contrary to the direction God wants us to go. In the Old Testament, there's the story of a prophet. And God so clearly says to him, I want you to serve over here. Go this way. I want you to do this. And the prophet doesn't want to do it. The prophet literally makes the decision to sail to the furthest point that's the opposite direction that he can think of. So he gets on a boat, starts sailing that way, and God allows him to sail into a massive storm. And the storm that he sails into is, is because he's fleeing from God. Because he's going in a life in a direction contrary to where God wants him to go. Sometimes the storms that we find in our life are because we're choosing to live a life contrary to God's direction. It could be that, that you realize that greed led to that business decision that is causing the storm that you're in right now. It could be that you realize that your arrogance led to this relationship with alcohol. And now it feels like you can't keep the bow pointed into the waves. And so all of a sudden the water is coming in over the sides and you feel like you might get capsized at any moment. Sometimes, sometimes the storms come because we're fleeing from God, but not always. Sometimes storms come because we're following God. Quick question, not rhetorical, really looking for a response. Who was it? that said to the disciples, let's sail on the other side? No, really. Who was it that said to the disciples, let's sail to the other side? Jesus. Yeah. Don't forget, the disciples were following God. They took him at his word. Do you remember the way that the verse started off? It said, so right then and there, just as they were, they took him, they went to the other side in the boat. Do you think Jesus knew when he said, let's sail to the other side, that there was gonna be a storm? I think Jesus knew. I don't think afterwards Jesus was like, my bad, I forgot to check the hourly forecast. Like, it said there was gonna be sunny weather, but I don't know, it's just a, no. I believe that Jesus knew. Jesus knew exactly what was going to happen right when he told them to go. Here's the reality. The reality is that we should expect hard things when we take a step of faith to follow God. The reality is that we should expect resistance when we take a step of faith to follow God. Now, now I want to be careful to say, I'm not saying that every storm in your life is something that God has brought to you, that God has caused every storm in your life. What I'm saying is that God has allowed you to go into that storm because every storm has a purpose, he may not have caused that storm, but he allowed you to sail into that storm because he wants to do something in you. Every storm in your life has purpose. If the wind is in your face right now, if there's a part of your life where you feel like you're in the middle of a hurricane and you can't keep the bow in the waves anymore, you can't hear yourself think over the roaring wind, pay attention. 
Because God is doing something on purpose that he can only do in this situation. He may be redirecting you. He may be building you. But I can tell you right now, it is not accidental. Every storm has a purpose. God is doing something in you. So let's go back to our story in Mark chapter 4. Remember, for the disciples, this is not a figurative storm. This is a literal storm. To pick us back up, we're in Mark. A furious squall, an intense wind, gale kind of a storm comes in. And it came up at the, and the waves broke over the side of the boat so that it was nearly swamped. And there's Jesus in the stern, in the back of the boat, sleeping on a cushion. You got to see that like this is really, really bad right now. Disciples and all the boats around them are about to go under. They're terrified. They're screaming at each other over the wind to try and get their attention. And then they see Jesus is sleeping in the back of the boat. And this verse, this verse really, really gets me. Mark 4, 38, they finally get his attention. The disciples woke him up and they said to Jesus, teacher, don't you care if we all drown? Don't you care? And I just want the weight of that to hit. Jesus, don't you care? Feel the intensity in this, the terror, the crisis, and even the anger. Jesus, we're in this hurricane right now because we were obeying you. And you're saying that you knew about the storm before we sailed into it. Why would you have us sail into it? Because we're all about to die right now. And you're just wrapped up in your down comforter like the Queen of Sheba back here. And we're all just trying to stay alive. Like wake up, grab a bucket and bail. Do something because if you don't, we're all going to die. And I'm beginning to think that maybe Jesus, you you don't care, teacher. Don't you care? Honestly, I felt this before, and I doubt that I'm alone. Sometimes when we're in the middle of the own, our own windstorm, the windstorm of our life, it feels like God's asleep in the back of the boat. And we find ourselves wanting to say, Jesus, don't you care? Don't you care if I lose my job? Do you care if we lose the house? Do you care if I have to lay him off? Don't you care about my family if my family falls apart? Do you care about my kids, about my sister, about my mom, about my niece? Don't you care about my friends? Don't you care about what they're saying about me? Do you care? Jesus, are you just a teacher? Because I'm in the middle of the storm right now and I don't think I need a teacher. I need something more than a teacher right now. I need a God who can actually help, who can actually like help bail the boat out. Uh, don't you care? The core of this talk today is this. In life, we all have seasons of smooth water. And in life, we all have seasons of rough water. Every one of us experiences this. We all know it. We can expect it. If you're in a season right now of smooth water, that's great. And I think you can expect that in the future at some point, you're going to be in a season of rough, rough water. It's just true. However, Christians often think that we have to pretend. Pretend that there's only smooth water, that there's never any rough water. Christians oftentimes wonder, is it okay for me to not be okay? Or do I just have to put on a face and say, God is good all the time, God is good, and pretend like on the inside, things aren't falling apart. We say God is good and we try to put on a brave face so that our friends and our family, our loved ones, even God doesn't know what's really going on on the inside. That's what we hope. Because on the inside, we're terrified. We think at any moment, I might drown. And I'm not even sure you care anymore. We're in a series right now called All the Things. And the idea behind this series is that life is full of the full range of emotions. We all have joy and anger and excitement and fear and yet our God is a God who can meet us in 
all the things. Even in all the storms, he's big enough to hear from you. Don't you care? He's big enough for that. So the disciples are there saying, we're going to die. And Jesus, I'm not even sure if you care. I don't know if you can hear me. I don't know if you're just a teacher or if you have the ability to do anything else. Don't you care? And then Jesus wakes up. And this is the part of the story that we all love. Look at the next verse. Jesus gets up. And he rebukes the wind and the waves. Rebuke is such an interesting word that he says to the wind, stop it. He rebukes the wind and the waves. He says to the waves, quiet, be still. And instantly the wind died down and it was completely calm. We all love this part of the story. I love this part of the story. The drama of it is unbelievable. When things were at their very worst, when it looked like at any moment the boat's going to tip over and it's not just the disciples but the whole community of boats that are out there, it's the worst possible instant. And Jesus stands up and says in a strong voice, quiet, be still. And we love that because sometimes that's what happens in the middle of the storm of our life. Sometimes Jesus stands up and he speaks and immediately things change. Sometimes he speaks and immediately you're healed. Immediately the loan comes through. Immediately the deal lands. Immediately the hire shows up. Immediately the project is completed. Immediately the relationship clicks. Sometimes he speaks and all is calm. And you know that there's something else coming here, right? Because he doesn't always do that. The truth is sometimes we call and call and call and call and he doesn't calm the waves. And so what do we do then? What are we supposed to do when he does not calm the waves? When we cry out and the wind still blows and we still wonder, do you care at all? We're gonna turn to Psalm 42 because I think Psalm 42 gives us a picture of what to do when he doesn't calm the wind. Psalm 42, verse 1 through 3 says this. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. I think that first verse is a verse that we have horribly misinterpreted for a long time. We've turned that verse into a really pretty nice Thomas Kincaid painting about a lovely deer in a lush forest drinking at a brook. We've turned it into a nice song as the deer pants for the water. Let me tell you the picture that's really being painted here. This psalm was written in the ancient Near East where drought and water scarcity is a real thing. This isn't a picture of a deer completely satisfied. This is a picture of a deer who is dying of thirst in the middle of extreme drought. This is a picture of a deer stumbling along, looking at every single corner they can find to say like, I'm going to die if I don't drink right now. This is a picture of desperation. This is a picture of intensity. And the psalmist is saying in the same way that a dying deer in the middle of extreme drought is looking for water, that's what my soul feels like. My soul thirsts for you, God, the living God not just a teacher. When can I go and meet with you, God? Because it seems like whenever I show up, it's not the right time and you're not there. My tears have been my food day and night while people say to me all day long, where is your God? The psalmist is saying, teacher, I'm in the middle of a drought. It feels like I haven't heard your voice in ages. Where are you? I can't find you. And all the storms, do you care? Can you hear me? I'm not okay right now. And will you show up when I'm not okay? And everybody around me is saying, where is your God? Everybody around me is saying, he's just a teacher. He really can't do anything in the middle of the storm. So you better get out and start swimming right now. They're saying, where is your God? And the psalmist is saying, are you there? Or are you just a teacher? He pours out his heart to God again and again, saying, please show up, please show up, please show up. And then it's interesting, in the middle of this storm, or in the middle of this psalm, rather, he shifts from talking to God to talking to himself. It's interesting, he does this self-talk thing. The next verse, this is what he says. Why, 
my soul? Are you so downcast? Downcast is interesting to me. The word downcast literally means sinking. <laughs> why, my soul, are you sinking? The boat might be, might be sinking, but why do you feel like you're sinking why, my soul, are you sinking down low? Why are you so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Not just my teacher, but my Savior and my God. He is saying, look, when my soul feels like it's sinking like a boat, I am going to choose to remind myself in the identity of God. I'm going to remind myself of who he really is, that he's not just a teacher, but that he is God, my Savior. When I'm forgetting and I feel like I am sinking down, I'm going to remind myself of the promises of God, that I will yet praise him. I'm going to remind myself of the future. When it feels like I'm sinking, I'm going to remember that the boat may go down, but there is something bigger happening than this present crisis. What we learn from Psalm 42 is that when the miracle doesn't come, when he doesn't calm the wind and the waves, when the miracle doesn't come, the answer for us is to remember. When mir the miracle doesn't come, memory is the pathway to faith. Memory is the path to faith. Let me tell you what I mean. You and I are unbelievably forgetful creatures, aren't we? Especially when it comes to the things of God. I think you and I have spiritual amnesia that tends to come out more when it feels like the boat's about to sink. And we start saying, don't you care? Don't you care? And it, it doesn't matter how many times in the past God has proven that he cares. When the boat's about to sink, we ask that question, don't you care? We forget that every storm has a purpose. He, he may have just allowed us to, do, to go into that storm, but he's doing something in us. We forget that, that there's a kind of faith that can only be developed in all the storms. And it can't be developed without intentional memory of who God is, of what he has done, of what he promises for the future, and who he has said that we are. Let me put it this way. Your memory, your memory of yesterday will determine your steps today. What you remember about what God did in the past will determine how you act today. Memory is the path of faith. Your memory of what he did yesterday will determine your faith of today. And your memory of what God does today will determine your faith for tomorrow. Do you see this? Memory is the pathway of faith. Memory demands that we live our life differently. The world, in the middle of the storm, the world says to you, start swimming. But in the middle of the storm, God says to you, start remembering. Start remembering the battle is in the mind. The battle is in the mind. We have to remind ourselves of the truth, of the good that he's done, of the promises for the future, and we allow our steps to follow what he says. I have a friend um, that I was talking to a couple months ago, and uh, his, he's just got a lot of crisis in his life right now. And he was telling me about a new discipline that he was starting. He was telling me about all of the research that talked about these disciplines of gratitude. Have you heard of this before, the discipline of gratitude? There's a lot of research about this, that if you have a discipline of gratitude where, where you are intentional about naming things that you're grateful for, and the research says you don't have to say thank you to anybody in particular, you just say thank you to the air. But when you notice things that you're grateful for, it can completely change your life. And I just chuckled on the inside because I love it when science discovers things that God has been saying for thousands of years. <laughs> Here's the truth, guys. Memory is the path to faith. When we regularly have a discipline of remembering who God is, what he has already done, remembering the gratitude, the grateful things that we have in our life, when we remember his promises, when we remember who he says that we are, it builds our faith and it can direct our steps. Steps. Your memory of yesterday determines your faith today. Your memory of what happens today can determine your faith for tomorrow. Memory is the path of faith. So let me put it all together. Let's put it all together. All of us in our life will face the tempest. All of us in our life will face the furious squalls, the windstorms, 
And some of these storms come because we're fleeing God. Sometimes we face a storm because we're going in a direction opposite to where God wants us to go. Some storms come, though, because we're following God. And you ask, how do I know the difference if, it's, if I'm in a storm because I'm fleeing or because I'm following? You read his word. And if your life isn't aligning with how he wants you to live, it could be that you're fleeing from God. And you pray and you say, God, is this a storm that I need to, to change course? Or is this a storm where you say, press on? But some storms are fleeing. Some storms are because we're following. But the truth is, every storm that God allows us to go through has a purpose. Every storm has a purpose. The truth is that God is developing a faith in you that can only be formed in the crucible of wind and fear and waves. God is developing a faith in you in this present crucible that can mark you for the rest of your life. And he's not developing this in you because he doesn't care. He's actually developing it in you because he does care. Because he does care. So if you're overwhelmed in the tempest right now, first invitation I want to give to you is to get honest with God about the rough waters. Instead of pretending that everything is okay, get honest. Ask him, is this storm I'm in because I'm fleeing from you or because I'm following you? And if he tells you that it's because you're fleeing from him, it's not too late to turn. It's not too late to say, I'm gonna start sailing in your direction. I want my life to match up to the life that you want me to lead. It's not too late. And if the storm is because you're following God, I know it's hard, but I actually challenge you to praise God for it because he's developing a faith in you that can only be developed in this present crucible. And throughout it all, remember that, that your life and your soul is more than this situation right now. First, Get honest with God about the rough waters. And second, call out to God. Ask him for help. And if he shows up and he speaks and he calms the wind and the waves, praise God and remember it. Remember it. Allow the miracle of today to fuel your faith when you find the storm of tomorrow because it's going to come and your memory will determine your faith. So remember it. And if he doesn't bring the miracle, if he doesn't show up, remember. Remember the way that he's come through yesterday. Remember what he's done in the past. Psalm 42, 6 says, my soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you. When the miracle doesn't come, memory is the path to faith. It's where you say, God, my soul is sinking, and so I will remember that you're not just a teacher. You're the living God. That you knew this hurricane before I felt the first breeze. That you're building a faith and life in me that can only be built here. That you are the God of power, and you do care about me. And you do care about my family. And you do care about the people that I care about. And you say that I'm your precious treasure. You say that I'm not alone and you actually care about me enough to allow me to go through this. Remember that he went through his own storm, that Jesus went through the storm of taking on our sins on his shoulder, of letting himself be downcast, capsized, and crucified on our behalf. Remember that he remembered us first, that he purchased our salvation on the cross, and so we can remember him. And put yourself in situations where other people can remind you as well. This is why it's so powerful for us to gather as a community of faith. Because we can remind each other. We can tell each other the ways that God has shown up in our lives. And we can actually find fuel from somebody else's faith. If you don't have relationships like that, if you don't have a small group or, or a mentor or spiritual friendships that can remind you of the truth, I, I hope you get in one. In just a couple of weeks, we're gonna be launching uh, groups again around here. And if you're not in a group, I really hope you get in a small group because we all need someone to remind us. So we're gonna close. And as we do, I know in a room this size, many of you, hundreds of you, 
are probably in your own hurricane right now, in your own windstorm. And I want to give you a moment to call on God, and I want to be a friend to remind you of the truth. So if you would, can you all stand with me, please? And I'd like to pray for those of you that are in the hurricane. I'd like to encourage those of you that are wondering if you might drown at any second. So could you bow your head and close your eyes? Let's enter into an attitude of prayer. And if that's you, if you're in that tempest, or there's someone that you love that's in the middle of the windstorm, and you want me to pray for them, I invite you to raise your hand right now. Raise it high so I can see it. If that's you, oh yeah, raise your hands high. All around the room, raise them up. Raise them up. Yeah. I see it. You can put them down now. So first, I just want to invite you, if your hand was raised in your own word, ask God for the miracle. Ask him to show up. God, we are a weak people. The only strength that we have is because you've put strength inside of us. And we all have these storms in our life and we are desperate for you. Please, God, would you show up? Please, Lord, would you speak? Would you remind us that you do care, that you're not sleeping on the back of the boat? Please move in power. God, please remind us of what's true about you. Remind us that you're alive. You're not just a teacher, that you are Savior. Remind us that you see the full picture. Remind us that you are building a faith in us that can only be, be, be produced here. Remind us of the ways that you've done this before in our life. Help us to be a people who remember you, who allow our memory and our actions to go together. Show us, God, how we need to walk differently because we remember you. Lord, build our faith. Build our faith. We pray this together in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Hey, if you're new, right over here to my right, underneath the screen, we're gonna have our Discover Willow gathering. Just 10 minutes or so, it'll go fast. For the rest of you, friends, go. Go in peace. We'll see you next week.